Welcome to what I believe is the first um, talk in the series of talks with the artists to accompany the Storytellers exhibition. So the exhibition is next door and it's going on, um, it opened on last week and it's going on until the 25th of February. And I would do, it's not on every Saturday, but on most or many Saturdays between now and then, you can come and hear the artists themselves talking a little bit more about their work and their practice. Um, which I think is a really lovely insight and completely um, accompanies the theme of the exhibition, which is all about people telling their story and artists telling their story. So um, a big welcome to you at this first talk. My name is Marg May, and I have the rather special and rather wondrous delight of talking to um, Jill Holder to talk about her work. Um, so there will be um, a chance to ask questions. So I'm, well, you know, I've got I've got a whole load of first, and I'm going to take take the floor. But um, uh, there'll be a chance for you to ask questions as well. So if something occurs to you as 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 she's talking or going through, do kind of jot it down or you know put it to memory in your head, and then you know we can we'll certainly allow time for that at the end. Um, before we start, we just thought um, Jill and I both thought we'd just ask how many of you have actually seen the work already and listened yeah and oh and have, have you managed to listen to the audio as well okay all right so um, that just allows us to kind of know what you've what you've heard about um, um, so we've got a lot of fresh we have fresh, lovely yes. views <laughs> fresh it's fantastic um, so Jill is described herself as an image and object maker um, I would also add to that that she's um, a collector, but uh, also perhaps more importantly, an arranger of things. Um, loves faces, boxes. She's also a collector of days, as you will have seen from the journal. Um, and she works a lot with the topics of memory and homage and time, as well as sometimes suffering and what's going on in the outer world. Um, and I think what's lovely about Jill's work for me, it's invariably interlaced with a playfulness and um, a bit of surreal humour and juxtaposition that really kind of cuts through, I think, to the, the, the viewer to go, oh, right, so where am I now? And how does that make me see the world differently? Um, so um, I'm going to just um, kick off with a question really Jill about the work so tell me this is a really lovely work and when you walk as you you know when you walk in it's just there pride on the wall what um what started you off from the path to create this work um I think the first time I really thought about it was when my mother died which was fairly recently she left um um a note to say that all her diaries were to be destroyed unread which I did the dutiful daughter so I've no idea what was in them, whether she'd written about me or <laughs> her innermost thoughts, I really don't know. I do know that she used it as an aid memoir as well because she could always tell us when we last visited or what she'd given us for lunch or whatever. So that was the first thing. And I guess that had been on my mind really, this idea of you, she'd kept it for 40 or 50 years. So a very, very long time. So, and then it, and then it was hard work to destroy as well. I burnt them all. So it was that. At the same time, I was watching the Saxon Chronicles on the television. And I know that's not really real, but they did write some chronicles and there is stuff from the period, you know, that we could learn about what was going on at the time. And this idea of things being written, whether they were intended for us to learn from or whether they were really intended for the person that was making them, really doesn't matter because in the end, we learn from them. So you have uh, Samuel Pepys, which I reread, and the Diary of Anne Frank, which I read, and then I, um, I in translation, um, and then um, I also watched the, um, the adaption of it, the, the screen adaption. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, I don't keep any sort of diary, really. Mine says six o'clock, coffee with Pat. It doesn't say anything more interesting. That reminds me when I'm supposed to go to the dentist. And all of those things that I put into it are things from the future. So um, I haven't reached them yet. They're to remind me that they're going to come. Normally, all the other ones that I've been talking about are written in retrospect. They're things that happened yesterday or last year. So I was quite interested in that kind of combination of time and the fact that if we look at global news, I'm kind of living my own global, global thing. I'm part of it. I can't separate myself out from it. And yet I feel completely separate until I started doing this. I really, you know, I would read the newspaper as much because it had a decent crossword at the back and I'd scan through the front of it and I might pick something up in the middle. But I'm not really an avid news reader. 
So doing this work actually forced me to do that. So, uh, sorry, I've skipped a bit, really. I, just, I, I, I chose what I chose because I'm an artist. I'm interested in the visual arts. You know, for me, I do enjoy writing, but it's not something that I've ever pursued in any, any real sense. So it was obviously going to be something like that. And because I'd been thinking of faces anyway, because of some of the other work that I'd done, it occurred to me to, to do a small face that would um, reflect what I felt about the news. Or maybe I just got out of bed and I was in a bad mood. You know, so those faces all mean something to me. Sometimes you all work very hard to wonder, you know, why on earth I chose that particular thing. Sometimes it's just plain obvious. So, um, yeah, that's about how I started. And then, because I had all this in my head and then, you know, was invited to do the show about storytelling. Well, this is a story that I've got in my head. And this is the reason to actually make it rather than just daydreaming about it. So that's... So you, so <clears throat> you really you sort of conceived of the end product at the very beginning and then, and then had, to, had to kind of go through the execution. Or how much did it tick shift as it went along? Yeah, it, it do, my work always shifts, actually. Um, it, it's never what I first see it to be. This one's probably one of the closest um, I started making the faces and the aim was I started off by making one a day and being very strict and all the bits that are on it are gutter finds they all literally come out from the gutter they've gone home they've been dettled and the paper and cardboard and things were all in my bin I didn't and I've used uh, sort of the ends of bottles of um, nail varnish and they're all it's all rubbish so I've lost my track yeah, so it's just about, you were talking about that, it was, it, how it took shape as you went. Oh, yes. So um, I started off very disciplined, you know, I'm going to make one a day, but it didn't work because sometimes I'd find several bits of rubbish. Some days I didn't find any at all. So I really couldn't do it like that. And also some days I'd find several fabulous bits of rubbish and could only choose one. So I gave up on that idea. So I stuck in the end to making one face and... Um, um, I would I would make a cardboard face maybe and then and then decorate it. If it was a really miserable day, I might make the faces for the next few days, but the the, the, the backgrounds, but not the things that went on it. So every day the bits were chosen for that day, but they weren't necessarily actually found on that day. So when I was looking at the faces, so um, when we met, we met for coffee for a chat beforehand, and you said I'm not political, but actually. <laughs> And my work is political, but actually, it is. It may not be party political, but it's certainly very political. And I, and I think as as you've developed in your in your artistic career, it, it's got more more that way. So yeah. I'm I'm very I'm sort of interested in um, I guess the the react the way that you put the politics and then the the juxtaposition of the day to day, the mundane. You know, sort of something dreadful happens in the world, and then the green bin still needs to go out or whatever. So why and how does that, how does that work together for you? Um, well, the idea, the idea of actually, the, the, you've, you've probably found that the writing itself, the entries, are really quite hard to read, and there is a reason behind that. I, um, and it's to do with the fact that actually remembering what the news was on September the 21st last year is an incredibly hard thing to do. And even if somebody says, well, you know, it was X, Y, Z, and you, and you say, well, hang on a minute, what, what did he actually do? You can't really remember it, unless you're a journalist or it's your thing, isn't it? So that, that was the first thing. The other thing was that it's this weird dichotomy between that being the world that I live in, therefore I am a part of it. I'm, but I'm not. I'm not doing anything. You know, twice I haven't even voted because there was nobody I wanted to vote for, even though my grandmother was a suffragette and I ought to know better. You know? So I don't feel that I'm really... I don't have any say. You know, on that there are things, you know, things that went extinct. There's billions spent on space travel. There are politicians over and over again lying to us. I don't have any control over that at all. And yet I'm a part of it. I'm an integral part of it. And maybe if I wasn't in it, some butterfly in another, another country would die. You know? So I don't know. So the, that, it's that weird juxtaposition. And that was partly what I wanted to get across. You know, the boldness of writing in a diary with a different pen every day. Something that I had found you know, for that day. Some days had loads of headlines. And I just, I just went for the one that attacked me the most or was small enough to fit in the square perhaps so um and then um but I've then you know it's got my own dental appointments and things like that all mixed in because I'm living my life while that's all going on yeah, yeah. so we we went in earlier on and we were looking at some of the the, the favorite images have you got a couple that you that you really liked or um 
stomach flu. Yeah, well, there are some that are easier. I mean, obviously now it's nearly two years since I made some of them. So, I, you know, I have to peer along with the rest of you with my glasses on and, you know, try and get to the bottom of what was it I was writing on the background there. But some are quite obvious. I don't know if you spotted um, the death of the Queen with um, a nod to Damien Hirst where I've, I've used crystals. Um, and, uh, and then the next day she's lying in state with the flag at half mast and a few days down she's buried with violets down the grave. Um, but there are others. I mean, there were, there were all sorts of launches. I mean, we were sending stuff all over. The billionaires were just trying to get away, weren't they? You know, it was such an awful year, they didn't want to be here anymore. And we've got um, things like, um, there were wars all over the place. I mean, eventually, I started to become really very depressed because I could not find any good news. All the news globally was bad. I had a friend who had a baby, that's good news. But it wasn't globally good news. And there are some, it was pointed out to me, who would consider that bad news because we don't need any more of us, you know. So to actually find anything where you could say, oh, look, you know, we've achieved that, you know, the carbon levels didn't get, nothing happened that was good. So towards the end of it, I was becoming quite depressed. And actually, since then, I haven't even looked at a newspaper. So I'm just taking a rest from it. I don't know how journalists cope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think the, um, um, so there's just a few that, one thing that struck me as well was about how, I mean, you clearly scanned the papers massively because you're pulling in information and stuff that happened that had completely passed me by, you know. So I've got a couple of ones here that is a, a suicide bomber in Peshawar, inside the police compound, killed 100 people yeah. and ended 157. It's like, what? You know, and know. so the, and the, breadth of, um, the breadth of the news that you were gathering was really, so that would have been quite oppressive, I think. Mm. That must have made you think, what yes. is really happening to the world? It took me out of my own happy little artistic yeah. world. Yeah. and threw me into something that I just had no, you know, I mean, that's the thing. I, would, I wouldn't have picked it up either, no, you know. No. But the research was a result of my news agent loved me for a year because I bought all the papers. And I was really interested in how different papers, I mean, we all know this, actually, but I'd never researched it before. Perhaps if I'd gone to school and studied journalism, I'd have been forced to. But, you know, newspaper, you can read the same article. You wouldn't know that the woman they're talking about is the same woman, for goodness sake. They, they pick on different things, you know. Yeah. So there was that, and then obviously extensive um, um, web research, you know, and discovering that Al Jazeera is the best news and the BBC is about the most parochial, awful news. Sorry if there's anybody here who works for the BBC. <laughs> but it was really, uh, the BBC hardly picks anything up that's foreign until it's foreign, until um, it's kind of hits them between the eyes for some reason, you know, and yet there are other people who are actually out there on the ground being killed to bring us the news that we hear, you know, you don't even hear about them. Journalists die all the time. I didn't realise that. Did. I mean, it sounded dangerous to go and be in a battlefield, but actually it jolly well is dangerous. Mm, yeah. We only see the ones in flat, yeah, highly we detected don't. in the flat jackets. But then, the, so, so then back to the humour and the playfulness in it. So there was like some of my, I love the, the, the Queen. There was one of them the day that Boris resigned with a lovely, yeah. beautiful <laughs> face. It's just like this large clown-like nose saying, hey, it gets me. It so summed up his character. I really, I really love that one. Um, and there was a very nice one as well with um, the day that, the, was it a bee vaccine? Had oh, been yes, discovered? the bee vaccine. Yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. That a, was the day before I found the head of a Lego, you know, the little tiny Lego toys. I found the little yellow head, nothing else, and half of his features have gone. But I used him, so you've got this bee there, and he just sits there on a bone rather than wings and looks out at you and winks. Yeah, he winks. <laughs> he's got a really cheeky little smile saying, Guess what, I'm free. It's really, exactly. it's... I'm really more important than I thought. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, it's really, it's really fabulous. So, um, um, yeah, those are, those are brilliant. The other one that I've got, you've got Ed Sheeran appears a number of times, which makes yeah. you wonder what your relationship with Ed Sheeran <laughs> is, actually. I don't have any relationship. I mean, my <laughs> studio actually has a radio. It doesn't have any other music system, and the radio itself is pretty old-fashioned anyway. It gets Radio 1 all right there, and it gets BBC, it gets Radio 4. So um, Ed Sheeran kept cropping up throughout the year when I was out there. He produced a lot of stuff, you know, and they played his stuff even when it wasn't brand new. And it had a calming influence on me. Here I was dealing with all this nasty stuff, trying to make it a bit more fun, you know, and in, in, inject some Jill Holder into it. And then this chap who is so calming and kind and thoughtful and there's no face to him. He's a really gentle guy, you know, who gets on with people. You, you, he, he gets on with anybody. It doesn't matter who they are, you know. And in a way, it was like having a nice friend in the studio. So actually, he, every time something came, oh, yeah, that's today, Sid Sheeran. <laughs> I'm not a fan particularly, but he's, yeah. 
And one of the things about journaling and um, well, it's interesting. You can be, you can do write journals, or you can also be a diarist. You know, if you think Samuel Pepys, you wouldn't call him a, you know, obviously not a journalist, but you call him a diarist. Mm -hmm. It's just how, uh, and you talked about it before. The truth can be obscure, or else everyone's got their own version of the truth. So, um, on a kind of slightly more uh, fun, mu more amusing note, one of the, my favourite entries on the writing, because I was peering around trying to school writing, was saying, 19th of July, Salisbury, naked bagel, hot. And I was thinking, what was Jilly up to? She claims she can't remember. So that's but um, it's interesting, just like my interpretation of that, and obviously, you know, your interpretation. But I'm, I'm, I'm wondering there, you know, on reflection, you've done a visual journal. Mm -hmm. You've been a visual diarist. What do you think your position is in that? Do you, is that is it a, is it something for other people to see? Is it a, what's the legacy that comes comes a result of that? What kind of diarist are you, if you like? Um, uh, yes, I did make it for other people to look at, but also for myself. I'm an arranger, so you know, when, I, when I say I arrange things, you know that is just another version of it. Really, I've only recently come to understand that most of my work is about arranging things, but um, there's. I've lost it again. So, well, I'm, I'm thinking really about, 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 <laughs> about if, you, if you are recording the oh, world as it is, yeah. what's truth and what's not truth, what's yes. subject and what's objective, and whether or not you can believe what Samuel Pepys says. Can I believe this world? Is it the world according to Jill Holder? Is it mm. actually real? It, it's that whole sense yes. of truth being obscured. So, so how do you get at, at what's real in all of I this? I think you know, a lot a of it, time? yeah. The, I don't know about the what's real. I had to go for what I found. And... Um, yeah, I mean, there's no guarantee. I've actually said, I think, for anyone who did listen to the, to the stuff that, you know, I'm not an historian. I'm not going to guarantee that everything there is absolutely right. It's as good as I could find it and as close as I could keep it. But um, there is... Um, I keep losing the one thread. I'm sorry, you keep coming on a really interesting thread and I keep losing it. I'm so sorry. Don't worry, that's absolutely fine. That's absolutely fine. So... Um, so the, I wanted just to move to think about the aesthetics of it because it was mm -hmm. the thing that struck me in the room and it's just beautiful. And I mean, it really is. And, and the, I love the colours, the way the colours go through. How much did you think about the aesthetics of the whole? I mean, you're, I mean, I suppose it's for me, it's the, it's the question of managing the detail mm -hmm. and being very precise about that, but making sure that as a whole it fit together and flowed. How did that, how did yes, you that tackle that? Yes, that touches on where we were, doesn't it? Because you were asking about who's it for. So... Um, for me, it was a journey of discovery. My work's always a journey of discovery. It's about finding out whatever it is I can find out. It might be about the making, it might be about the subject, but there's always that in it, otherwise it never gets made because I'm not interested in it. So there's that side. But it was also made, I was thinking very much in terms of other people because I'd been reading these other journals and diaries and the effect that they'd had. And I was sort of thinking, you know, because people like Anne Frank had, had, had kept a diary and it was, what was she? Was she 13 years old? She was, she was young, wasn't she? So it was seen from her point of view. Now, most of the information that we have about the Jews being hidden during the last war comes from adults or, and either adult Jews or adults that actually kept them or helped them escape. To have something from really quite a, quite a, a well-educated young woman who, who actually saw it from her point of view and included snippets of information about what the adults around her were saying and the rules and regulations that she had to follow in order for them to survive, made me realise that although she wrote it really for herself, I don't know that she did write it. It was later published um, by her teacher or something in Holland, I think, and that's when it, 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 she didn't write it for that reason. And it started me thinking, well, I'd like to show this news in a different way. What we watch at the moment is we do read newspapers. We do as I did, and we follow the web, if we do it. Um, but there's word of mouth. You know, we, we don't have town criers who tell you what the latest no news is anymore. So in a way, this is, I suppose I was trying to, partly trying to invent a new way that might be interesting across the board, yeah. something that children might be interested in rather than just... You know, because actually the use of found objects isn't accidental and it's not just because I've used them before. It's because it's another of the things that is very important about the lives that we're yeah. leading now. So, that, you know, that was the reason that I did that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in fact, it was, we had a lovely moment, didn't we, in the gallery earlier on where we, um, we were in looking at it and this family were just up, just yeah. as we walked in, this family were at the far end and they were all peering out and there was a, 
um, uh, I suppose I, you know, I presume a mother and a father and three children of different ages, you know, whenever children of different heights as well. So there was this visual, really, against this beautiful backdrop, colourful backdrop <laughs> of this family all pairing and all, all having their own little, with it. Yeah, yeah, Exactly. Yeah. Across, it, I mean, in a way, I've achieved that. So it, it does seem to be interesting. I mean, my, my carpenter who made up the frames for me actually said to me one day, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to bring my wife tomorrow, is that right? I said, yeah, sure. So he said, uh, he said, I don't get it. You know I don't get it. She won't get it either. But I want her to see all these weird things you've picked up. <laughs> and I thought that is a win, you know, yeah, because yeah. I don't care what the reason is that people come and see yeah. it. The people come and see it and get something out of it. That's enough for me. I'm happy with that. Yeah. So um, and one final thing. So the, the, it is, the title is Toward the End of Greatness. And I mm. just, I don't know, I'm interested in, why that title and when it came to you at the beginning, the middle or the end of the of Okay, work. so... Because um, this was a year of your life, really, yes. where this was a very dom, you know... It was, a year, year and a half, really, because mm. obviously once I'd made all the faces, yeah. then there were, you know, all the... I mean, <laughs> it took me two days to do each board just gluing the faces on because yeah. I had to make little jigs to hold them all, all in place while yeah. the glue dried, didn't you? Yeah. And some disasters where the glue that I was using wasn't the right glue and I had to get another glue, you know, so. But anyway, um, so the title Towards the End of Greatness. It's, um, it's not my title. It's actually a title that um, astrophysicists use. And I don't really 100% understand it. I've given a better thing on my talk thing. Um, but it, it is at the end of, not the universe, but the gathering of all the universes, where they don't know what there is. And the idea of there being, and, and they can't take it any further because time runs out. So it's all these things that I don't understand, all mixed up together that make this amazing, for me, title that is one of what I call a tummy wrencher. And um, I, I heard this because I was, uh, you know, but, but very in included in it. There are lots of launches. I don't know if you all realise how many there were last year, but there were so many launches. We, we went everywhere. We, <laughs> we had them flying out around Saturn and Venus and Mars and the Moon, and they were absolutely, you know, just around the Earth. They were, you know, Russians went up um, and joined the rest of them. I thought, oh, they're going to get shot when they arrive. You know, no, no, they were all really good friends, you know. So um, anyway, that was quite interesting. But Towards the end of great, yeah, I thought, you know, because I'd become kind of depressed, about two thirds of the way through, I heard this and I thought, I hadn't got a title for it yet. And I thought, that's the title, because that's what we're doing. We are heading towards the end of greatness. Unless we do so, we're killing each other, we're butchering each other. You know, our, our, everything that is going on that I've learned over the last year is all about destroying ourselves and the planet we live on. So although there's a lot of humour in it, that was the bit that depressed me. You know, and so it's like sometimes trying to get to get trying to get a really serious point across. The best way you can do that is to make it appear apparently funny, and then you look at it and you realise that maybe it's not so funny after all. And and I, I think that sums up beautifully what you've done because it is it is incredibly serious and compelling. It is humorous and funny. It is aesthetically beautiful, and it's intricate and full of full of interest to satisfy curiosity. Can again and again and again. So you know, it's a really. Mm. Um, Really lovely thing. I just want to check in with um, and ask about some other things, and then I'll come to questions. Um, because I suppose, as I say, you know, you, you sort of um, and being in the beanie as well, because the beanie, there's so many collections in the beanie, and um, and you've collected, you've, you've done an exhibition, the collection, the beanie as well. But you know, you are a you arrange and you collect and you order things and put things together. Um, but you did a show, didn't you, down mm. in the front room of the Beanie? Um, and I was really interested in particularly that the um, it's sort of opening up not just what you've done, but how you kind of construct work with the public working with you. And you did mm. one on elephants that I thought was really, yeah. really lovely and really well fascinating for all the all that juxtaposition was kind of right in the centre of that too. Yes, actually, we've got some elephant makers in the room, haven't we? <laughs> um, <laughs> the idea I actually love. Um, I often call it engaging with the public, but pieces of work like this are more than that. They're about, um, they're about hel help, helping, I'm trying to come up with a nice word for this, helping the public to understand that art is for everyone. And the fact that you didn't learn about it at school and you can't draw doesn't mean that art is not for you. So one of the ways that I've discovered is actually to get people making art for me, even when they can't. So this particular idea, um, 
I had some uh, small, small pieces of cardi paper and uh, pens, and everybody that I could grab as they came into the gallery, I said, oh, I need you to draw an elephant. They had nothing to copy. There were no elephants around. It had to come from their heads. You know, and it's like it's got a trunk and it's got this and it's got a tail, you know. So, and they made beautiful drawings. And I had children and I had adults. And I had quite a lot of them at the end of it. But, of course, there's always the flip side. And on the other side, I'd been thinking, I'd found this um, unbelievable drawing, which was one of those that you can find on the web where you're allowed to use them, um, of elephant tusks in a huge, um, huge pile. And uh, so I didn't tell the elephant drawers this. What I did was I mounted this, a very big drawing, it was four by four, and um, I put all, mounted it together with all the little elephants around the outside. And the idea of it... So there were two, it was twofold. One, encourage people to get involved. They'd made a work of art with me. It wasn't me. All I did was really place it. But it made everybody, the people who'd drawn the elephants and a lot of other people who hadn't even known it was going on, suddenly understand this, how brutal this thing is of where ivory comes from. I know that it's, it, it's more known now um, and people are aware, but they have been told, you know, don't buy ivory and things. But actually understanding the reason why we don't do it. These elephants are fabulous creatures, you know. They're really fabulous creatures. And we've been doing this to them. And it's still going on because there is still a market for ivory. So, so yeah, that's what those elephants are about. But they were charming. I've still got them. I don't know if any elephant makers would like their elephant back. Ask me and I will look for them. I can see three of you. Who else was there? <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps it is just you three, yeah. Anyway. Well, there's just something really important about doing that in this space, in the beanie, yes, isn't it? Which absolutely. Which causes so totally. much of that colonial past. There's a lot of stuff there that you yeah, wouldn't be able to collect and now. how you can start to try and put something else around it nowadays that will, exactly. will help re reuse, re reuse it, it and, and reinterpret what it was and what it means. I'm going to interject here because actually there's another thing that I firmly believe, and I'm just going to say this, it's going to be very controversial, I'm sure, but I am so against people tipping sculptures into the Thames or wherever they're going to tip them. What is wrong with actually making the point? Well, you do that and it's gone, that's it. Nobody's learned anything. You just got rid of the sculpture. Why don't you just make a new plaque that says this guy is famous because he opened three schools for homeless children. Sadly, he also employed 1,226 slaves. Then people would learn from it. So that's the same thing. That's the same thing. That's and the same that, thing. and, and that's, that's the, the love of juxtaposition. That exactly. You're, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You'd rather that's see exactly it right. square up to exactly. the, 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 yes. the two sides of the, of yeah. the coin. So, yeah, it's good. Um, and then the other one that, that I um, know that you've done, and this is one that I unfortunately didn't get to, was about um, the exhibition of boxes, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which I think was really well, was the first one in the area. Was it? Yes. All right, yeah. it was really lovely. Can you tell us a little bit yeah. about that? Or, okay. Yeah. There were a hundred boxes. I, I mounted them on shelves, um, closed. And the idea was that people who came into the gallery could actually open the box and then play with the contents or just look at them, whatever. Some of the boxes um, contain things that uh, you would just expect to be there. Um, I, I had my uh, aunt's old jewellery box, which was just um, cream plastic, you know, with gold leaves around the edges of it. And then you opened it up and it was that kind of stripy, nasty velvet stuff with a, a ballerina that went round and round to a little song. It was empty when I got it, but I filled it with the sort of things that I thought she might have put in it in the 50s and 60s, sort of Soir de Paris perfume and popper beads. You remember those with yeah. the little pops and um, various things like that. So that one just was what you'd expect, really. And then there were others. Oh, another one that was exactly what you'd expect. There was a matchbox with a, ma a dead mouse in it. <laughs> so that's, you know, every boy's pocket used to have those. I don't know if they still do, but they did when I was young. My brothers had them. <laughs> this wasn't a real dead mouse. It was a stuffed one. But um, then I did, um, there was a violin case as well, um, <laughs> which when I bought it, all the leather on the outside had kind of rotted away. So it was just metal. I didn't know they were metal. I, I, they probably aren't anymore. But anyway, so it was a bit rusty. When I opened it, it, it just went bananas. It was full of moss and they all fled for their lives. And um, I'd, all I did was I put um, a little gadget that when you release the pin, it played a very sad violin solo. So when you open the lid, the pin was released and inside there was just, um, just the curly bit. So none of the rest of the violin was in there anymore. And it was just as though all the music had just sort of and, and the dreams had just kind of floated away into the atmosphere and just left this echo. So 
There were, yeah, that, those are the sort of things. Like, yeah, there's like yeah, enough yeah. boxes, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think there are all sorts of secrets and weird things and things to think about. And I mean, I had a, another one that was um, a shortbread tin that was mine. And I'd had it from when I was five years old. I remember my grandmother giving it to me. And she gave it to me because she didn't want it anymore because the lid had pushed in. So it was about this size, Crawford's. And uh, inside it had the things that I thought were precious when I was four or five. And they're not things that, you know, I had a blower and there were things like that. So it was like every little girl's box, you know, yeah, exactly yeah, what yeah, you'd yeah, find yeah, in one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's those, um, and those are all, I mean, that's why I see that what you do so much is also about memory mm. and pulling out those sort of bittersweet, those bittersweet yeah. moments and the things that really are poignant and, yes. and evoke, um, yeah, evoke times gone by, really. Yeah. Um, Gut but if you're only yeah, well, <laughs> probably stronger than poignant, there you go. Yeah. Um, so... I'm just going to open it up. Any questions from you? <laughs> Go. One thing you haven't mentioned, which we spoke about at lunch, was the one, the thing you did that made the news. Which one? Oh, Chillum. Oh, Chillum. Oh, oh, Chillum. Oh, Chillum. Yes. More elephants. More elephants. <laughs> More elephants, yes. Okay. Um, I, yeah, okay. So uh, I used to collect a lot of elephants, all sorts of elephants. And it has nothing to do with elephants. The reason that I collected them was because it fascinates me how many different ways one thing can be seen. So I had this huge collection, a lot of them were quite big, and when I moved to Kent, I just didn't have, didn't have a big enough place for them. So uh, they all stayed in boxes, these big elephants, for years. Um, I kept the little tiny ones, but the big ones, no. And I had to do something with them. Anyway, I was taken for lunch one day to Chillum and um, spotted this sign on the wall that said, the elephant house. And it's like, well, what's all that about? You know, and the person that took me said, oh, well, you know, this Victorian guy imported two elephants, you know, to clear the forest in Chillum. Oh, okay. Because he'd lived in India. That story. Yeah, oh, he'd okay. seen them working and he thought they'd be perfect. He, I'm sure he had other reasons, you know, <laughs> it's like, charge you to see them all time. I don't know. But anyway, so it had an elephant house. That's long since been converted into, um, into a dwelling. But so I sort of had this in my mind, and then the next time I was clearing, trying to clear out the attic, you know, I was like, oh, all these elephants. And sort of thinking, um, oh, the other thing that struck me was that Chillum is a very, very beautiful little village. I mean, exquisite. I'm sure most of you know. Really beautiful buildings, and it's been conserved, and there are no 1970s flat tops in there. You know, they just didn't allow it. So, um, but, but although one or two people from Chillum disagreed with me, most of the people that I met agreed that the original thing of Chillum as a village, when it was like that, wasn't there, that bonding of people anymore, where you, you knew the person when they were born, and then you, your daughter or your granddaughter went and nursed that person when they were dying, you know, and sort of where a family went hungry, the other families would help to feed them, you know, or give them money, or they'd all turn up to every funeral. It's just not like that anymore. They do do things together. I mean, they're a sort of thriving theatre group and yoga, but none of this original kind of stuff. And I thought it would be interesting to try and bring the village together so that um, in, 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 in another way. And th what came out of thought? Well, I've got these elephants. So we numbered them all. You actually helped me number them. We numbered them all. And um, in the dead of night, there were 10 of us. We actually went and parked in Chillum's car park and we crept out into the town and we put these um, all up people's footpaths and along the walls and you know, standing on the top of posts and things like that, elephants everywhere. And then we crept back out again and I'd made breakfast for everyone and we sat in the car park and we ate our breakfast and then we all went our merry way. And I didn't tell anyone. And somebody did, because the newspapers found out about a week later, they, they knew who it was, who, who had done this. But um, part of my thinking was, apart from, I love the idea of injecting some magic. I really like that idea, the idea of magic, especially if you can achieve that with some adults. You know? So what I had really hoped was that the people who'd received one or two, some, some of them got several on their wall, elephants, would actually hang on to them and keep them. And then when they sold the house, they'd sell the elephants with it. That seemed to me, I, I would have done that. And, um, but sadly, they didn't. Um, one of the pubs in Chelham took a lot of them. I was just saying earlier, I think um, I really ought to go and have a look and see if they're still there, because he put shelves up on one wall and they were all on these shelves oh, for a while. Okay. So I don't know if they're still there. But um, 
Yeah, so, it was, so in a way, that was almost, to me, underlined the fact that I thought they weren't very together anymore. And they were demonstrated demonstrably not. Yes, exactly. <laughs> the, 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 um, as far as... The, everyone was very happy. I didn't get anybody saying, oh, you shouldn't have done that. No one was cross, you know. that we'd, We didn't enter properties or anything like that. But um, one of the funny things that did happen was I, I like boot markets. It's where I get a lot of my rubbish from. And, um, of course, what happened, they started turning up in boot markets. I knew they were mine because they had the numbers on the bottom. So I'd buy them back and creep back into Chillum in the dead of night and put them back on walls. And I did that for about three months till eventually they and I got tired of it. <laughs> I love it. It's a fantastic idea right now. I remember waking up one morning and um, we lived just up the road from Chillum and suddenly someone said, last night Chillum was elephant bombed. We're going to sleep in place. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it would be great like, yeah. to try and track them. Pretty unusual, wasn't it? Together with numbers. So how many elephants did you, were you on your numbering? Oh, golly. Do you know, I don't know. It's about 300 or 400, yeah. Wow. Yeah. It was quite a lot. Yeah, so just <laughs> go home, any elephant in your house, look underneath. Thanks for some of my team. <laughs> oh, and Gulliver, of course you were. Yes, that's right. Yes, of course you were. Sorry, Gulliver. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yes, exactly. No, quite heavy. Some of them were really big. I mean, there was um, a China toilet brush, you know, the China China thing, you know, and then the brush that went. I'd never used it. And, uh, <laughs> there were all sorts of weird elephants. People make elephants. Oh, it's weird. We are weird. Me yeah, like I can imagine right. all shape sizes, <laughs> colours. I mean, people paint elephants yeah, on the decorate. Yeah, yeah, the collection of tiny ones I got—they're all about that. They're guided and by. I've got end trays, which are the printers' trays that were all flooded the market when the printing industry died. And I've made doors for them with frames and glass, so they've got to fit in those holes. And the biggest holes are always—that's the biggest. But you only get two or three of those in a box, so I have to choose the very, very, very best big ones and then all the rest are little tiny and I've got plastic I've got Disney I've got Lego there's a, there are Lego there's a Lego elephant I've got all sorts you know there might still be some hidden there because Max put them deep in some of the bushes oh did you they might still be hiding there. <laughs> we should have buried them shouldn't we and then we could have just taken photographs and instead of showing <laughs> Anyway, magic. Any, any advice on elephants or bombing small villages? So you know it. <laughs> um, any other questions? I was going to ask, do you think Picasso influenced you or African art? Um, I think Picasso influenced most artists. I'm not sure that um, it was all, but most. Um, I don't know. I mean, I read a fairly damning um, article about him the other day where they were saying, oh, he was just rubbish and da-da-da. And I thought, you're... You don't get this. I mean, I think the thing about Picasso that was so special was that he produced so many different ideas that so many artists have taken one of his ideas and they've made a complete career out of it. I mean, for me, I've always been very... I've always hated the African mask work, actually. I've never liked it. I couldn't see the point of doing it. But um, I think he has influenced me. Ganika probably more than most of his other work, which is the one, the war in Spain, the civil war. But, um, yeah, I'm, I don't think I could make my work had it not been for Picasso. But I think I'm a few stages removed. I think I'm more closely linked to um, pop art and surrealism, really. I think that's, you know, Picasso, of course, influenced those so heavily that I can't say no, you know, I've got to say yes. But I don't, I, I think you'd be hard, foot, hard put to actually see to see, to see it specifically in my work. I mean, the other thing that we've been through now is this huge thing of psychology, hasn't it? Um, I mean, it, it sort of started around then and artists were interested in it. Now it's become every day. It's, you know, people, people keep diaries about it. They do things on the web. You know, it's all, our mental health has become something that is a real talking point. I'm sure it'll fade eventually because so much of it seems to be sort of, you know, a bit iffy to me. But... Um, yeah, I don't know. Mm. See, I don't really like his palette. Which you, uh, let's ask you, what do you think? Do you see his work in my work? Well, I, I think I saw a lot of... But equally, I saw African influence with the masks, mm. like yes. the African masks. Yeah, I, I own a few African masks, so I think that probably has come from there. Mm. Mm. Um, Which influenced Picasso, anyway. They did, absolutely, yes. Mm. Yeah. Don't know. I mean, I don't like his palette... I've never, I've never used his palette. 
I don't, I don't, his colours are horrible. <laughs> you, you, you like them, don't you, Tracy? Yeah. Typical. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean that in a bad way. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Any other questions for Jill? Uh, I have one. Can you talk a bit about fences and your fascination for fences? Yes. Well, I've been thinking that it was recent, but I've realised now, ever since I said that to you and I went home and started thinking about it, it's not recent at all, is it? <laughs> I've got a whole show. The trouble is, my mother died in the beginning of 2020. And for... Um, for what I suppose nearly four years before that, I was only just about here. You know, some of the time I was going down every other week and then she got iller and I was going down, you know, and staying there for longer periods. And eventually I took down a suitcase and stayed there for two years until she died. And during that time, I did make work. I carried on making it. Some of it was about, um, about my mother and the situation she was in. But I, that's when I started to become fascinated with faces, I realised. There's one uh, show that I really want to do, which will be in a very small box, which will have an awful lot of faces inside it. And then there's another one that I've got where um, actually in the boxes exhibition, I made a whole box of images and they were all from one photograph that one person took of me. And I've altered them. Something like, I can't remember now what they were, but they were something like a thousand photographs. And I've put them in this box, which was an old slide box. So it's full of them. And I'm thinking, oh, you know, that, that, you know I just like the idea that you open this box and it's like it's full of me, you know. But actually, it could be reworked because I'm thinking I need to show. At the moment, I'm doing a lot of work on, um, on jelly plates, which are, I don't know, is, is, is there anybody who doesn't know what a jelly plate is or if you come across them? It, it, it is made out of gelatine, but it's an industrial version. And you can ink it up and then you can put paper on it and you can take a pull from it. Or you can mask it or you can put stencils on it and those sort of things. So I was intrigued by this because you don't need a press. That's the lovely thing about them. You just use your hands, you know, you can use a barrel if you like, but your hands will do. And um, having done all this rather heavy weight stuff, I wanted to do something a bit lighter. So it's turning dark. I can't help it. They always turn dark. But anyway, so at the moment I'm working on faces with that. And I'm now, you'll be amazed to say, made over 50, I discovered when I counted them. <laughs> and that, it doesn't include the ones I sold the other day. So, so but they've, well, these are all, what I'm trying to do, what I'm really fascinated with here is finding the faces, not drawing them. So I'm taking pulls using this ink. And it's not like putting things through a press where you get a perfect image. What you get is a slightly... You know what um, Italian walls or Greek walls are like when the sun's been at them, you know, and they go all peely and... You kind of get that effect. It's not as strong. But you can put layer after layer, and if you know which are the colours that are transparent, you can use several colours one after the other. So you get this weird kind of... It's peeling away look. And, of course, the result of that is that if you then start thinking, okay, where's my head going to be? Oh my goodness, there's another face in it. So I'm using these faces. So I'm finding them. I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just calling it finding faces at the moment. That's as far as I got. But anyway, so watch this space. It might be faces next. Hundreds, it's, it's hundreds been, of them. It's been a little um, sideline into, into. Oh, yes, I made some jokes as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, friends she gave me a roll of copper. And at the same time that I started doing these prints, I thought, oh, maybe it would be nice. Maybe my friends, you know, you can't afford these ridiculous prices that artwork ends up costing. Maybe I could do some small things that my friends could buy. And um, I saw this copper and I thought it'd be really nice to make because I thought of making brooches like that. And then I thought, well, no, you know, they're too, you know, they're too ephemeral, really. And I can't put a decent price on them of any sort. So uh, that won't do. So the idea was shelved. And then I found this oil of copper. Well, I started cutting and I realised I couldn't make jewellery out of that either, actually, because it's so thin that it would hurt. you cut yourself and you'd ruin your clothes. So I rang a local jewel, jewel, jeweller who was advertising classes and said, you know, could I, could I possibly come? I, d I don't really want to make rings or anything like that. And she asked me about it. And I sent her an email with some photographs of some drawings I'd done. She said, this looks absolutely fascinating. You won't be doing anything like anybody else is doing here. She said, I'll ask the class. So apparently she asked the class, did they mind if they had a mad artist? <laughs> and uh, anyway, the answer came back, yes. And I was very disruptive. And um, they gave me, they <laughs> I made all the backgrounds and I thought, oh, I don't really know how I'm going to make the faces on these because I started off thinking I'd just glue on bits I'd found like I did for those. And then I thought, I can't do that. It's not going to work, you know. And then Louise, the jeweller, came up and she said, 
I've got something that's got fan things in it that you might like. And she gave me this box and I opened it and it was stuffed with really interesting shapes of copper where the other copper, the other jewellers have been cutting bits off, you know, and then it weren't in there for recycling. Yeah. And some of them had been enamelled and they were beautiful shapes and colours and all sorts of that. Yes, found brooches, that's what they are. <laughs> so that's what I did. Perfect, <laughs> oh, I can imagine. So that's the, that's, um, yes. I mean, that's everything together, isn't it? You know, it's like the maker, the artist, yeah. the, the collector and the arranger all in. All in gathered little, up together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're even signed. They, they're not signed, but they have JWH stamped into them. <laughs> you nowhere know to go with you. No, they're gone. <laughs> <laughs> they're My gone. friends did buy them. I was oh. right. <laughs> yeah, collectible pieces. Everyone's got one. Collectible <laughs> pieces. If you haven't got Natalie's one, Natalie's wearing one as well. <laughs> so, um, any any more questions? Um, just oh, come on. Because I've got one. It's in my box. It is. That's what you are. You are always containing all that. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's part of the arranging. It's hard to do arranging if it's not got some sort of border to it. Yes. Yes. I you know how I think I'm probably moving away a bit from that now. You're right about the jewellery boxes, and I hadn't really thought of that. I was just thinking, oh, you know, it's jewellery. It's like it's copper, and then my city found things. I'll put them in a nice box. So um, I've got one question, which maybe maybe is our, our, our final question. But um, and it's a little bit. We were texting last night, and and you know, it's conscious. It's quite. It's a it's a thing, isn't it, to sit up here and talk about your work. It's a thing to show your work, and then to talk about it. You know, you're really. It's quite an exposing thing. And I, I do. So many artists I know have to try and balance that desire to show, because of course that's you really want people to see it, um, and um, but equally the vulnerability that gives you know so you want to communicate and you want to be brave but it does mm-hmm. take a whole load of bravery because mm-hmm. really yeah. you're showing your innermost everything's mm-hmm. and um and you you were telling me about a, a really a hilarious story yeah. i say hilarious but it was just about about, about, about exactly that about navigating oh, those, those the one feelings yeah 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 okay um i used to show um there's a, a gallery in London in Notting Hill Gate called England & Co. And um, several times they had pieces of um, my bo- of my boxes uh, for mix shows. And um, the very first time I showed with them, um, I was so impressed. You know, a London gallery. Oh, blimey, they're taking some of my work. I mean, I was so excited. And um, in London, I mean, it's just a little street. And... Um, there's one of those coffee shops that you find in London that are run by Italians. You know, there's always a big Italian guy behind the bar, you know, and he's got kind of Italian pastries and proper coffee. Then less common now. I mean, we are going back a few years here. But um, I thought, I'm going to have a coffee. I turned out, I'm going to have a coffee. So I sat there and I sat at the table, like just like this, sat there with my coffee with the window here, you see. And I saw people going by. And I thought, oh, they'll be going to England and Co. Because there's nothing else there. It's just residential, you know. So I watched them go by. Was it the private just, view or was it? It was the private view, yeah. I, I'll, just, I'll just finish my coffee and more people went past. And then I, I said, well, you know, I'd like another coffee, please. So down the second cup of coffee, you know, and I sort of waited. And like, oh, dear. You know, and people had stopped coming by then. So now I knew that the room was full. So I, said, yeah. so I had another coffee. <laughs> and the guy said to me, haven't you got somewhere better to be? And I said, I'm supposed to be down there. He said, oh, are you? So he said, well, he said, they'll be coming out any minute now. And he was right. The first people started to come back this way. And I had another coffee and more people came back that way. And when the last people had gone, I got up and went home. That's how terrified I was. <laughs> I just could not face going in. <laughs> I was so, you know, you do get used to it. Every now and then you do have people who are extremely rude and they don't like the work and they don't get it and they don't want to listen to you and they've got no time, you know, and it's, if it doesn't say. I had, I had a conversation like this the other day. Work should always say exactly what it wants to say. I don't want to hear what you've got to say about it. You should know. And if you don't know, then it's a really bad piece of work. And you lay yourself open to it. But I got more used to it now because I sort of think it doesn't really matter what they think. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's like I make it primarily, I make it for me because I would die of misery and depression and loneliness if I didn't make it. Yeah. On that happy note. <laughs> well, no, well, thank you. Thank you for the burst of bravery that got you here. Thank you for showing in the show and thank you all for coming to the show. <laughs>